Is curiosity an advantage? What is curiosity's role in an increasingly algorithmic world? And what happens to our brains when we explore curiosity? It turns out my next guest loves asking these questions, and he even wrote a book with some of the answers. He's the founding partner of the global consulting and design firm, The Ludic Group, and one of the authors of the book, The Curious Advantage, an exploration of every angle of curiosity, historical, anthropological, business, and more. He cites curiosity as kind of a superpower and an essential quality in a growing digital age. Today, we're going to discuss the curious advantage and the difference between active and passive curiosity. Academic and musician, fellow podcaster, honorary curiositor, Garrick Jones. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Meredith. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So when you and your colleagues wrote The Curious Advantage, you did a lot of research. Can we kick things off with talking about Mm. how do you research curiosity and what did your research tell you? It's fascinating. We started off asking questions about learning because we had a hunch that learning was really at the heart of, of the digital realm and how can you thrive in the digital realm. And the more we researched, the more curiosity came up and the more uh, we looked at it from neuroscience or behavioral or um, the psychological or, um, you know, the more we looked at it, the more this word curiosity came up. And so we gave up and we just decided to focus on curiosity. The fun thing about that was that we were then in a learning state (laughs) and we were asking questions that, um, uh, you know, were new to us. And we had a very interesting and curious process for our research. We wanted to do a broad scan, sort of multidisciplinary. What are the neuroscientists saying? What are the behaviorists? What are the management theory people saying? What are the psychologists, the child psychologists? Um, what are the people who know about you know, the, the, the pheromones and the hormones in our systems? What are they telling us about curiosity and the state of it? Anthropologists as well. And we, we took all of our um, research threw it into an um, online system called Evernote. I don't know if you know it. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's a great program. And then from there, we applied some artificial intelligence to all of this research, and we did some cluster analysis. And the clustering sort of brought us into a number of groups of interesting things about curiosity. And that clustering, weirdly, um, fell into about seven or eight groups, and um, five of them began with the letter C. And... <laughs> We played a game thinking, well, can we call all of them by the letter C, which was a bit of a, <laughs> you know, a, a little bit of a, a, a trite construct, but we, we did it anyway, and it was fun. And guess what? We came up with seven big clusters of information, which we called the seven Cs. And as soon as we said the seven Cs, we suddenly went, oh, my God, sailing the seven right, Cs. Right, right. Sailing the seven Cs of curiosity. <laughs> and the, the metaphor threw itself at us. And which really played into then what became our um, sort of defining uh, definition of curiosity, which is um, to have an attitude of wonder and a spirit of exploration. And that became sort of my mantra when it comes to what does it mean to be curious? We think have an attitude of wonder, but have a spirit of exploration. And it's that difference between the wonder and the exploration, which makes the difference between, as you were talking, passive and active curiosity and so on. Fascinating. It is fascinating. Was there any one benefit across all the disciplines of being curious when you were doing that research? The one benefit of being curious, well, I mean, it comes anthropologically from a fight or flight situation. If you learn information, you immediately go into a kind of tense, your, the, the hormones in the body release cortisol and you get tense, but you get curious because you need to know, <laughs> am I safe or am I in danger? Uh, if I touch this, will I be hurt? If I go open through, you know, if I open that door, will, will there be danger on the other side? So being curious makes us actively aware and makes us much more present, weirdly. But that's yeah. an old, uh, because of our old um, way of, of being built as, as humans. And another one of the neurosciences um, came up with we, when you're curious and somebody gives you a piece of gossip, not a fact. If someone gives you a laundry list of facts, um, they're interesting enough. But as soon as somebody says, did you know about so-and-so, <laughs> this happened, we immediately pay attention and all the neurons fire off 
um, in a way that is different. And we store that information because that kind of curiosity we store because we think it might be useful for us later. So gossip has <laughs> turned out to be really helpful in terms of also keeping us safe um, and storing information down the line. Those were some of the interesting things. The, 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 I mean, the obvious thing about curiosity is that it uh, keeps our brain, you know, neuroplasticity, keeps our brain active and alive. And curiosity not only stimulates the hormonal response um, that our brain needs to keep making new connections, but it also seems to have an impact on us physiologically. That is, um, my, my fellow author, Paul Ashroft, is really into um, sports science. And um, he, we, he, he talks about climbing and, and the impact of curiosity on the body in terms of rehearsal and practicing and getting over fear. And the, the thing that he discovered was that we have a thing called the vagus nerve right. in our system, which runs, you know, it's the main nerve that runs throughout our entire body. And there's a thing called the vagal tone, which is a kind of rhythmic um, electromagnetic uh, wave that we give off. And the vagal tone um, is, is hugely stimulated by curiosity. And you can actually, curiosity takes us into an awareness and a hyper awareness of, our, of the things around us. But it actually, the, the more we stimulate the vagal tone, um, we, we stave off, they think, things like um, uh, some of those aging diseases. Uh, oh, that, like Alzheimer's and the, dementia? Correct. Okay. Correct. So there's something that it's, this is early days, and it's nice science out of the Netherlands. But um, there's something to suggest that curiosity is actually good for our well-being and our and our longevity. That is fascinating. I uh, personally relate to what you're saying, especially about the um, alertness. But I never thought of it in terms of fight or flight because when I record the podcast, I record. Uh, usually four to six at a time. So, you know, mm. I batch record them and I'm much more alert, like the stress of, you know, remembering everything and getting it all set up and executing it. It, if I don't have that, I know I'm screwed. Like I need the <laughs> nervousness right. and I need to be present to not just read out the questions, but to really interact with my guest. But at the end of mm. it, there is a coming down. And I always attributed that to being an introvert and needing my energy from being in solitude. But I wonder if it, it's related to what you're saying. Like it's okay. There was the fight or flight and then it's the come yeah. down after. I think it may be hormonal. You know, it may be entirely related to the, the kinds of neurochemicals that are going around our body. We, we get into a heightened sense, what we perceive as anxiety, but also just awareness. And then we open the door, we go into the unknown, and we start to relax because we start to do two things. We actually, at a, at a parasympathetic level in our body, we um, start to come off the I'm afraid <laughs> sort of cortisol response. And we actually move into a learning mode where our brain starts to secrete ephedrine and other kinds of um, hormones that allow us to make neurochemical um, connections. And, um, and, and that allows us to then store the information that we're learning in that situation. And once you've come out of that situation, you know, heavy storage of information, being aware, then you have a come down and right. you sit around the fire and you might feel exhausted or you might feel a little, okay, that's not as much fun as it was an hour ago, but we <laughs> it's, it's, it's why fairgrounds are so much fun. Oh, right. Well, I never thought <laughs> the roller of, coasters. right. I never thought of curiosity as a cure for brain fog. And, yeah. I, but I mean, kind of what you're saying, it is definitely for the dec mental decline that's due to inflammation and aging, but for just from day to day, just have a moment of curiosity and, you know, sharpen up your skills, be sharper at work. That's pretty exciting. When you talked, it is exciting. When you talked about, like, um, you said the curiosity is an attitude of wonder and a spirit of adventure. I am in love with that dual formula because an attitude of wonder is innate for sure, but a spirit of adventure, I think that speaks to the active part yes. of curiosity and then the, the wonderment maybe can perhaps be more uh, passive. So can you uh, kind right. of talk about the difference between the active and the passive curiosity? 
Well, what we found in the research, I mean, the original academic research is in a lot of psychological work done on what they call trait and state curiosity. Trait, um, state curiosity is, is that time when you're wondering, um, what, what, what is going, why is that blue? Why does the truck deliver those bottles at four o'clock in the morning? I'm curious. That's a kind of a, a state and it's internal. Trait curiosity is that when you're actively wanting to learn something, you get up out of bed at four in the morning and you go and you look out of the window and you shine a torch and you go, why is that truck delivering bottles or picking up the beer that's been drunk in the, at the party the night before? You know, it, the trait curiosity is about being active and being outside of ourselves. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that that active and passive, the, the passive curiosity is really important. It's important for um, uh, building our lives. It's important for dreaming. It's important for thinking about how rich the environment we want to be in is. And the more we have a kind of passive internal monologue going on, the more our brain is still remaining stimulated. But the, the act of curiosity, that act of picking a, a topic and going after it and physically moving your body and getting involved in learning and, and bringing that information into your body where you're modeling, it's a bit like a hologram, you, you're taking what has been learned outside and putting it into your brain, that has another huge impact on how uh, the neuroplasticity I was talking about earlier. I always think of, um, I recently became obsessed with vinyl records. I'm a musician, as you know, but right. I went into my storeroom <laughs> about uh, six weeks ago after lockdown and discovered my hi-fi equipment, my old turntable and some of my vinyl. And it had been there for probably about eight years. And um, I looked at it and I was like, oh my God, my vinyl. Um, wouldn't it be fun to, you know, play? I've got a very fantastic hi-fi system and it, I've got all obsessed by digital and, you know, streaming and it's all the best and studio quality and all the rest of it. Great. I've got wonderful sound in my environment. However, <laughs> I was like, what is this thing about warmth and, and, and vinyl and that? And so I got active and I got my um, turntable out of the storeroom and my amplifier and I had it fixed up and I had to look at things and, and learn immediately about I had to repair a few things which had got a bit old. I had to get some the right kind of grease and, and make sure that the, the, the system was working properly, um, which was fun, which was learning. And then, of course, I got out my at Miles Davis. Um, of course. Kind of Blue, which is my <laughs> favorite of all time, and um, put it on. And you know what? Uh, it was warmer and it was more present and it was incredible. But since then, of course, not only have I learned all the technical stuff about uh, the vinyl, I'm not all, what's up to date about the best record players in the world these days, what's happening in terms of how you connect that to digital and digital audio systems and so on. But I've also learned about music. I've started, you know, buying vinyl and finding that little known album that I really wanted to to find and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, become completely obsessed. But it's because I got curious about vinyl initially, internally, and then started to actively play. And, you know, during all of this, I was going, well, you know, I think I need a hobby. I mean, this is ridiculous because I, you know, I play the piano and I do lots of things that I've got <laughs> There's so much going on. But I woke up going, I think I need a hobby. And <laughs> then someone said to me, Yes, but you do have hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, vinyl. I was like, oh my god, yes, I do have a hobby. <laughs> so that's and hobbies are good things too for curiosity. For right, things. and that's so, more of the exploratory version of curiosity. But how does some how does someone who recognizes they're hearing this right now and they're thinking, okay, I definitely have more of a a consumption model of curiosity, mm -hmm. meaning like. Well, immediately I think of digital versions of this where, you know, I'm scrolling and I read seven headlines. I'm consuming yeah. the headlines. I know a bunch of facts, like you said, but I don't really take the time to explore these interests or the mechanics of how things work or the details of an article. How do you make that conversion from consumption model curiosity to more exploratory model curiosity? It's a really nice question. Um, I, 
I keep on being drawn back to the neuroscience again today for some reason, but <laughs> there is um, something to suggest that if we're scrolling all the time, you know, um, it's one way of taking in information. And yes, we do learn. The academics learn. Everybody learns from researching and, and looking through things. Um, but the thing about active curiosity is that it is, um, it's addictive. Oh, right. <laughs> it releases, it by physically going and choosing a topic, and learning, even if it's a language or something, and getting with a group of people to learn a language or going online, finding a group um, or a book club, for example, all of those things which are building on your innate curiosity and getting outside of yourself um, releases another set of dopamine and so on, other kinds of hormones that are curiously addictive and very, and very good for us and make us happy. So I would suggest... Um, what, one of the other things about only scrolling is that we um, we, we we might become uh, a, a victim, if you like. Uh, maybe that's not a good word, the, or the word I'm looking for, but you, we might become uh, trapped by what we call critical bias. Right. So, the, so, for example, if you're only scrolling, there's nothing to say to you, why am I not just following something that gives me pleasure? Or why am I not just following an idea that reinforces my own set of beliefs, for example. How am I learning about things that are going on in the real world that might be challenging? And the things about active curiosity is that by engaging with the real world, and um, you know, I got my turntable out and discovered that it needed some grease and I had to repair it before I could put the, um, the, the vinyl on it. You, you engage with a difficult reality and um, <laughs> Overcoming that is is very powerful. The thing about um, active curiosity um, and, and getting involved with it is it, it it's not only much more addictive, but we also learning from the real world and learning from the real world and those encounters with the real world and cur curiosity that way are the best way to ensure that we're not subject to critical bias. And Finding basically like an algorithmic that bubble. That's what I call yeah, it. Is, that's it. Yeah. Beautiful. That, I love that. So what you're saying is that not only, by, not only can we um, bust out of an algorithmic bubble by engaging in real world versions of what we are curious about online, but there is also yes. a neurochemical reward waiting for us, which is kind of cool. There is. <laughs> You've also there is. said I'm in another interview that part of being curious is staying with the question um, because because jumping from one thing to the next is, I mean, that's pretty natural. Um, sure. I'm just kind of, how do we stay with questions long enough to to move into that neural reward that you were talking about? Yeah, that's also a great question. I, I, don't, I don't have a specific answer for that, <laughs> but I know that there are rewards to be had from, you know, we say sometimes you've got to slow down in order to speed up. And just... We can bounce around from idea to idea, and you know, some people think of it as ADHD, and other people think of it as this is normal life. This is how you do it, right. and everybody kind of thrives and survives anyway. So I'm, I'm not one to say there is a is a, the right way of living life, but um, what I do think that there are huge rewards to be having to be had from sticking with something. For example, uh, my jazz. For example, um, I, I I play jazz. Um, but I haven't done so for a while, but my vinyl has, a, I played jazz with a friend of mine the other day because the vinyl stimulated us to do it. And this is amazing. You know, this, it kind of, when you stick with a topic, it's this, it's an infinite topic. All topics are infinite. Um, and there's, and the, you stick with them long enough and you find things that, that will reward you, I believe, even if it's not rewarding you things that you anticipated. I started playing jazz again. I, I realized I needed to, you know, re remember some of my theory, for example. <laughs> um, not much, not much fun, but it, it kind of switched on that. Okay, right. So, yeah, how do we do this again? Well, um, I think what you're also alluding to is the, like, the yes theory. You know, saying yes to things that are on your radar of curiosity and you're saying yes to trying them or yes to picking them up again or yes yeah. to exploring them more. 
uh, which sounds a lot more fun. It's a f- more fun way to frame it than, s- you know, you know, stay focused. <laughs> it's like say exactly. yes it's, and say yes over and over again. It's like the spooky house. You know, if you go to um, Disneyland <laughs> right. in Florida, yeah, in Florida. You, and you, and you take the kids to the, uh, to the, to the haunted house and then it takes you down. The, you know, everybody's petrified because they don't know what's coming, but, you take one step forward and you go, you open the door, you wonder what's beyond the door, you get through the door, yes, there's a fright, it doesn't kill you, it's safe, it's a safe environment. And I always say this, but you know, if there's a door you want to open, why not open it? Um, you might learn something, you might have an encounter that's fascinating, but be safe, of course, you know, you know, don't do stupid things. Paul, um, again, talks about my co author, talks about, um, getting confidence through curiosity. And he talks about the example of um, rock climbers. And rock climbers, you know those guys who go up Yosemite and girls, and they do it without ropes. And I know I've, I've watched half of a documentary because it was causing me heart palpitations. I had to stop, <laughs> it was so intense. <laughs> the point being that when they, when they learn how to do that rock climbing, Yes, they're building their muscles, but they go up a meter and then they fall, or they go up 12 feet and then they fall. And they deliberately learn to fall because they learn how to recover when they fall. And by learning how to recover when they fall, that gives them confidence to be able to do these incredible maneuvers as they go up the, the, you know, the, the rock face. And it's so learning in failure, it's the same thing learning the piano, um, you learn in your failures. You don't rehearse for the stuff you're good at. You rehearse for the stuff which go wrong so that if they do go wrong, you could get through that moment when you're performing. And there's something about not being afraid of failure, something about rehearsing stuff that isn't easy and learning about the stuff when you fall. Um, and that builds the confidence which allows you to start the cycle again of, of curiosity, open the next door. That's amazing. I, w- I really didn't consider a benefit of curiosity to be confidence, but it's really neat when you think about that, especially when you talk about the benefits of active curiosity. And I think that that's the reason I didn't think of it. It was because it wasn't, I was thinking of passive curiosity. When you were looking at all the research and maybe just from your personal observations, have you noticed any definite curiosity killers that people tend to slip into? Well, the, usually based on fear. That's where fear is. Um, the biggest killer of curiosity is fear. Um, and we might have all kinds of reasons <laughs> why we choose not to do something. But it's usually when you ask the question, what's behind that, what's behind that, it's usually about we were afraid of something. And when we encounter those things that we're afraid of, we actually ask ourselves, well, do I want to live a life like this or do I want to give it a go or do I, do I want to take one small step to overcome that? I'm not um, saying that all fears are not um, rational and people have real fears which, which need to be worked through. But the first step to doing so is to be curious about what life might be like beyond the fear. I'd say the biggest passion killer when it comes to, to curiosity is fear. That's interesting. I, I really love that. And one more question as it relates to curiosity, especially in, I think is relevant right now, is in resilience. Um, so I'm wondering if maybe you came across this again in your research or just in your personal observations because you're a curious person yourself. I've noticed that when I'm in a healthy place mentally, and I, ca- I lead with curiosity and someone says something ridiculous or offensive or whatever, mm. I'm less bothered by it. And I can yeah. genuinely go, really, how long have you felt that way? Or, yeah. huh, I've never heard that before. Tell me more about why you believe that. Is there a correlation between really- curiosity and resilience? There really is. That's a very nice way to put it. The, the research shows that we, when we're afraid or we um, aren't sure what to, you know, if we're in a defensive state, um, we, uh, we're aggressive and people, 
you know, we might encounter something and our response to that is aggressive. But when we're in a state of curiosity or state of wonder, as you put it, which I love, um, we are actually in another state of mind. And the same person may say exactly the same thing to you, but you respond to it in a different way. It's like going to the gym in the morning. You go to the gym. If you haven't been to the gym, somebody might bring you something tough. And you have a freak out and you growl. Um, <laughs> or in my case, you you roar. But if you've been to the gym, not only are you a bit tired, but you're full of euphoria because, you know, you, you, you've you got all these um, hormones going through your system. And that you're much more open to uh, what someone might say. And you're much in a better state to deal with these things. So curiosity and resilience go hand in hand because um, curiosity allows you to encounter reality in a different way, in a way that's more likely to lead to success in life in general. Wow. I don't think I could have ended this talk on a better quote, Garrick. Thank you. (laughs) As we wrap up, do you have any final thoughts on curiosity or um, do you want to tell people where to find you and certainly where to find your book? Oh, that's very kind. I would uh, love you to read our book, uh, everybody. It's called um, The Curious Advantage. And we really focused on curiosity in the digital world. So what does it mean for us now that we live digitally? And why is curiosity so important to us today and remaining curious and being able to be curious online? Um, Also learn about the seven seas of curiosity or sailing the seven seas of curiosity, which are the seven big chunks that we think curiosity has to play. And they range from things like understanding context, needing a community, um, curating information, being creative, constructing things by building things and learning from reality. Uh, Criticality, understanding how to use filters so that you don't just take everything for granted. And confidence, because confidence is the thing that gets built up by cycles of curiosity. fundamentally and also come and listen to the podcast that we do together on the next time on the curious advantage podcast lovely just can't wait for our conversation there i'm excited about that as well thank you again for coming on the show i really enjoyed this chat me too great questions i really appreciate it hey you're still here that's awesome i hope to see you next week too I talk with the most interesting people that you've probably never heard of. Most of them are paradoxical and bring an opportunity for you to grow as a person. So if you like bright, meaningful entertainment, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.